I want to bring greetings from my friends in Lac Megantic. Um, they know I'm doing this, they want me to do it, and they trust me to tell the story. You may have heard that uh, they're not, that you may have heard about the Netflix issue. I don't know if that's uh, resonated uh, south of the border where Netflix has been using these images for a number of its shows. Uh, one I understand about the nuclear holocaust. The dimensions of, of this, uh, this disaster were, were reaching that level. Uh, they're not, to, to put it diplomatically, they're not amused by what's been happening and you know, there have been some apologies, but in, at least in one case, they're not retracting, taking back, you know, um, just erasing what, they've, what, they, had, what they had used. Um, you know, I, I, I've, I've, actually, I've actually been, you know, I've, I, I was executive director of this progressive think tank, and in, in in the last years, I, I did a number of reports on Lac Megantic, and the way I came to it, I won't go into the, the details, but it was kind of, uh, I kind of, un, um, I kind of just slid into it, and then one thing led to another, and I, I actually ended up writing three reports. Uh, and when I first, uh, when it happened, I happened to be on vacation, and so I could spend more time uh, and I just was kind of transfixed. It was horrifying to see those images. And I had gone to university very close to this town, you know, and I, to, to see it happening there. And, and I very quickly, though, the blame game started. And, uh, and eventually it kind of converged, or very quickly converged on the last link in the chain, which was the locomotive engineer. And I thought, you know, I could write something that, uh, that I didn't have a vested interest, I didn't have a lot of knowledge about the railway sector, but I knew about the deregulation policies and its sibling policies. And so I thought I, I could. Uh, and then I got back to, uh, from my vacation and I, and I learned from my close colleague that she lost three members of her extended family. And so that kind of put a whole new dimension on, on the work, and I, as I said, I, I did three reports, and at the end of, end of it, um, I, I, I spent a year at the law faculty on a, on a fellowship, and then I, the publisher approached me if I'd write this book, and so that's, that's, the, that's the culmination um, of, of this, this work. And I, I just want to uh, preface my remarks um, by saying, um, I mean, the railways of both in Canada and the United States are really the backbone. I don't know where the backbone campaign comes from, but they they are the backbone, and and they were essential to the founding of, of Canada and in the and the development of of, of the United States. And the, the links are um, are uh, in, incredibly important uh, uh, mode of of transport. And I I support uh, railway workers. I support the regulators, the inspectors. Uh, who, you know, and there were voices, you know, warning about this within uh, the Department of Transport, the, in the Canadian Department. Uh, when I, yeah, um, the Canadians called Transport Canada, they use that, that language in Canada. But there were people who were warning that, the, you know, it, it, it was an accident waiting to happen. Uh, and, um, and I also support a strong and safe railway, a strong, well-resourced, uh, independent uh, regulator, and this is a story of regulatory failure and corporate negligence. It's a story of, um, uh, uh, as I say, a, a weak and under-resourced and dysfunctional regulator that was captured by a powerful r regulator or railway. And and what what I trace over a period of time. Um, uh, and, and I think a parallel process was going on in the U.S. Uh, you can enlighten me on that, but, but kind of systematic erosion of safety protections. Uh, and this was a violent consequence of that trajectory. Uh, and at a certain point, it became uh, not a question of if, but a, a, a question of, of when. So I am going to try to I hope I get this right. Um, okay, so that's 
That's the journey that this train took from Newtown, North Dakota, and it was headed for the east coast of Canada to the Irving refinery, his big refinery there in St. John, New Brunswick. It's about, you know, in all, that's about 4,000 kilometers. I don't know what that translates into miles, but someone can, can do the conversion for me. I should have done it. Um, so anyways, you can see it traveled down through Minneapolis to Chicago and then up to Detroit and then it entered Canada at, uh, at Windsor up uh, along the north shore of the Great Lakes uh, to, to Montreal. And the railway was, uh, was Canadian Pacific and, and Canadian Pacific was under uh, uh, the CEO of someone that may be familiar to some of you a guy named Hunter Harrison, and he's a major player uh, in this story. This story has heroes and villains, and uh, it's more complicated than that, but he's definitely on the, on the villainous side. Um, and he had all, actually, when Canadian National, CN, was privatized in the, in the 1990s, uh, very shortly after he, it was, uh, it was privatized. He became the CEO. He was a, he's a southern boy from Memphis, I believe. But he had a formula for running uh, railroads, which was called precision railroading. Uh, precision railroading. But it was, you know, he was a kind of laser focus on shareholder value, on costs, on cutting costs, on cutting staff, on fighting with unions, on, on really running roughshod. Anyways, he, he, has, he was brought back to, uh, uh, to CN after he'd retired from, or CP after he'd retired from CN, I'm getting string from the mic, uh, he, he was brought back by, it was then under control of, uh, of uh, uh, a New York based hedge fund uh, run by a guy named Bill Ackman and Bill Ackman saw the potential of CP in these circumstances and he thought the guy to bring back is, uh, is uh, Hunter Harrison, and he managed with a very small percentage of the, of the voting shares, he managed to control it, kicked out the CEO, kicked out the board, and placed his own people. Anyways, that's a part of the story. Uh, and uh, CP was contracted, and then they subcontracted uh, to a company called Montreal, Maine, and Atlantic, which was run by a guy named Ed Burkhart. And Ed Burkhart was kind of a shadow or a mirror image of, of, uh, of Hunter Harrison, although on a, on a, on a smaller scale. Uh, and he, he when, when CP, uh, it used to belong to CP, that line running through Lake, uh, Lake Megantic, uh, uh, to through Maine into to Brunswick. It used to be it used to be owned by by Canadian Pacific, and when it was deregulated, they sold off what they determined to be unprofitable railways. And he he was there to do the same kind of number on Montreal, Maine, and Atlantic. And so so that cargo was uh, picked up on February fifth, uh, and and by. Um, Montreal, Maine, and Atlantic. The locomotive engineer was, his name was Tom Harding, and he was the single operator, the single crew member in this massive train. It was 72 cars, highly volatile, back and shale oil. It was misclassified as low volatility, but it was high volatility oil. Um, and, um, you know, he was working on his day off. Uh, but he, he, he came in, he was kind of a model um, uh, employee, uh, which, you know, the, the, it was a company that had kind of tried to engender a cult culture of negligence. But he was a pretty responsible guy and had a lot of experience uh, on the railway, really from his childhood, and it was in the family. And he picked up that train at uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it took him about 10 and a half hours to get to a little town called Nantes, which is about 11 kilometers from Lac Mégantic on the top of a hill. So it's a very steep slope. Uh, and it took him that length of time because the track was so bad, but also the lead locomotive. Uh, and he reported it uh, shortly after it started. That lead locomotive was, was uh, 
was spewing smoke and it was halting and 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 uh, and uh, so that's why it would it should normally have taken four or five hours for that to for that trip. So he got there at 11 o'clock at night. So meanwhile, 11 kilometers away is the town of Lac Megantic, 6,000 uh, people. It's it was founded as a railway town. Forest products industry is big, dependent on the railway for for uh, uh, transportation. Um, it, it was a manufacturing center, but that kind of other aspects of, you know, of manufacturing faded during the globalization period of the 80s. Uh, but it's a, it's a really beautiful place. The, the lake itself is, is beautiful. It's a tourist attraction uh, in the summertime. Uh, on Mont-Mégantic, Mont there's a big telescope. It's known for its, uh, its crystal clear air. I'm just trying to paint a picture of this is a balmy summer night, uh, lots of people on the street uh, at 11 o'clock at night, and there are a lot of people partying at a, a nightclub called the Music Cafe. It's about 15 meters from the track. Uh, so he, he, um, he leaves the, uh, the train, he reports to, uh, to the rail traffic controller, he reports the problem again, they say, just, you know, we'll deal with it in the morning. He goes to his, uh, uh, his where, he's, where he's staying in town, and right after it, it happened, um, right after he left, very shortly after he left, there was a fire on the lead locomotive. Uh, the firefighters came and they put it out. And, um, and in putting it out, they shut off the locomotive air brake and that disabled uh, the air brake system. So the combination then of the hand brakes that he set and the air brake uh, started to, the air started to leaking out. And so the, that's when the, the danger started about midnight. Tom Harding uh, was informed by what had happened. Uh, he said, can I go back to the train? The rail traffic controller said, no, it's all right, stay there. Uh, I'll send someone else. Uh, you have to be working in the morning and the work rest uh, uh, provisions uh, meant that he, he shouldn't go back because he was, he was on duty early the next morning. And, and so that's why, that's why he, he was advised not to go back. And they sent a track guy to, uh, to check on, on the fire and everything, but he didn't really fully understand what the implications of disabling the locomotive brake. Tom Harding was prohibited of setting the other autom the, uh, the automatic brake, which is the air brake on the cars, on the 72 cars, so he couldn't set that. Uh, he'd been warned against setting too much hand brakes, uh, and so, um, so this is the, these were the circumstances under which uh, uh, you know, he, 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 he was in. So after about an hour, uh, about uh, just before one o'clock, uh, the, the air brakes uh, were not enough to hold the train and it started to move. Now I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. That's what a unit oil train looks like. Um, and you've probably seen them here. Um, that's Ed Burkhardt. That's just after, it's a small, small picture, but it, it's, uh, he, he was in the town about a week after. It took him a while to get there, but he wasn't exactly, uh, you know, um, a popular guy. Uh, he was, uh, he, there was a lot of antipathy. Uh, he he's lucky to get out. So, um, so, so whoops, I, I'm having difficulty with. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but this, and this is by no means the whole story, but um, these are some of the kind of the systematic under uh, eroding of safety precautions that happened uh, beginning in, in the mid 80s. And railways were given permission to actually draft their own operating rules. The minister had to sign off, whoops, uh, th th thanks for it. Uh, the minister had to sign off. Uh, but it was largely a rubber, a rubber stamp. Uh, f formally, the, the unions were involved, but m in most cases, they were just dismissed. Their opposition was not uh, paid attention to, and there were some really important changes that happened in the years before Megantic. Uh, and then the kind of the enabler 
in all of this deregulation was budget cuts, and budget cuts all the way through. But in, in 1995, the Transport Department cut budgets by, by 50%. If you can imagine what that does to a regulator that's doing oversight, um, uh, conventional oversight, on-site unannounced inspections, the ability to, to evaluate, uh, to, to, uh, to make proposals, uh, and and uh, I mentioned the privatization, NAFTA was also a factor. Uh, and then in 2001, they put in this sa rail safety regulatory system called safety management systems. I don't know if that's a term that, that you're familiar with, but basically it's uh, company self-regulation, which is, an, you know, in my view, an oxymoron. Uh, and they kind of pitched it as, a, as an additional layer uh, to conventional um, oversight, but it wasn't. And you had the budget cuts and you had, you know, fewer and fewer uh, of actual oversights. And, um, and, and so it became just a, they were, it was, became a, an auditing process, a paper exercise. And then the government of Stephen Harper, who was a fervent anti-regulation, kind of Trumpian, but not Trumpian, because uh, uh, I don't, I don't want to get into that, um, but <laughs> but he was an anti he you know was regulations as job killing investment killing, uh, and so he put in place regulatory policies which which in the end and he, one of those was called a one for one policy which you know you an agency proposed a regulation had to take one out, and you imagine a regulator already overwhelmed having to make these Hobbesian choices. Um, and so that's kind of this, that kind of sets the stage for, these were the series of events that really unfolded in 2012. You had the unconventional oil by rail boom, which really started to gain traction around 2009 and was, you know, reaching a real high point in 2013, 2014. Uh, both Alberta bitumen and back in shale. Uh, and so, you know, you had this powerful uh, railway industry that was blocking. I mean, you had this growing danger and you had uh, the industry was saying, no, no need to, no need for any further uh, regulations. Uh, what's there is, is sufficient. And the Harper government, of course, was focused on its energy superpower uh, obsessions and it was willfully blind to the dangers as well. And then you had the, the, the Irving Oil Company which decided to buy back in shale CP subcontract, contracted, subcontracted to MM, MM, Montreal, Maine and Atlantic and then they got permission from Transport Canada to operate uh, these trains with a single person crew. Basically the, the first one, uh, the companies created a loophole which allowed them uh, to do this, uh, and, you know, and then the railway lobby, you know, really pushed for this company. They pushed for the loophole, they pushed for the company, and I tell the story in the book of how it unfolded that despite opposition from the union, uh, or the company union, from the inspectors union, from, uh, from within uh, uh, Transport Canada, from the regional office, because they knew how much of a delinquent company this was, multiple safety violations um, and un went unresolved, and they thought this was the last company that should be gra being granted uh, uh, permission to, uh, to do that. So, so that's, uh, that kind of set the stage for, that's Hunter Harrison. And then this is what happened when the train started to move and about 15 minutes after uh, it started to move, it, was, it had gained, uh, you know, it's over 60 miles an hour when it hit the, the curve in the heart of Lac Megantic. Uh, and it spilled six million liters. That's the largest land-based spill of oil in North American history. Um, multiple explosions, uh, as you can see in the terms of the magnitude and, and uh, is the worst disaster in Canadian 
uh, industri in, uh, industrial disaster in, in, in peacetime, really, as far as I could tell. There was a wartime explosion in 1917, uh, but it was, it was just uh, horrific. And I've, one of my chapters is, is, about, is, is entitled Apocalypse, and it tells the story of what happened. And it's, um, I, it's a, it was a hard chapter to write, and I, I, I have great difficulty reading it. And so I've tried to kind of read excerpts, and I, you know, for an audience like this, and I've just given up. It's uh, just, it's, it, it's too hard. Uh, so after it, after, uh, after it happened, uh, obviously it was a crisis of confidence uh, in the regulator in Canada and in the United States, and the, you know, big flurry of activity. Um, you know, those people that were partying at, at that, uh, you know, at that, um, uh, um, that, uh, at the lack, at, at the, um, the music cafe, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, they had no idea of the danger that was, that they were facing that was so imminent. I mean, they just assumed that the regulator was, was, had their safety as their number one priority. It was a kind of a panic, and there was panic south of the border as well, and they were, there was lots of back and forth, uh, and uh, you know, there was a flurry of activity. Uh, the Department of Transport in Canada immediately, it was one of its first emergency directives was to prohibit single-person crews. Uh, but, but at the same time, the railroads were in there lobbying intensely to block, delay, dilute any actions to address this. And in, in fact, in the three months after, the intensity of that lobbying was greater than any level of any three-month period between 2010 and 2015. So that's kind of uh, just gives you a sense of what they were, of what they were, uh, you know, trying to, to stop. And they were, they were, you know, you know, they were successful in a, in a, you know, they, in, in a, in a lot of ways. There was, you know, they eliminated the old DOT 111s, which is the pop can on wheels, which had been worn by the transportation, five minutes, oh my yeah, God, a couple more minutes. Yeah. Couple more minutes. Uh, so there was all kinds of things that they, they, they did. Uh, and try to do, but there are all kinds of problems uh, with with those. Uh, and uh, you know, and I've people have talked to me. I've investigated, and I know what the risks are, and I know how the railways push back and were able to reverse these. Um, and I'm trying to where where does the buck stop? Okay, so yeah, so three frontline workers were charged with criminal negligence. Uh, no one, no company executives, owner, not charged. There was a jury trial. Uh, I attended uh, parts of the trial. They were acquitted, so no one's held accountable. Uh, no one in the government was held accountable from the minister on down. I mean, ministers have resigned. Uh, the Transportation Safety Board left a lot. It's, it's report, it reported uh, uh, about a year after, just over a year after. And, um, you know, there are problems with that report. There are a lot of good things, but I document in, in my book uh, uh, the problems, and they refuse to hold an independent judicial inquiry. And this is an example of, of a classic kind of perp walk, the three men. And it was meant as a PR, you know, the men were going into court, and it was meant to kind of a PR thing to to kind of indicate to the population that justice was being done, and someone yelled out in the crowd, "The right people aren't there." Mm -hmm. And uh, and I talked earlier about how the deck was stacked, and there's a long list that's longer than that. Um, and the risks remain. Uh, the questions are problems with the tank cars still, and I could talk about those in some detail. The volatility of back and crude and diluted bitumen the length and the weight of, of the trains and the condition of the tracks, that, that safety management system is still defective and it's still official policy. <clears throat> Fatigue management, major problems. It's on the Transportation Safety Board watch list. There are still securement problems. Um, 
and uh, and I I kind of go down the list there, but I'm I'm running out of time, and I do want to make a f a, f a, a a few points at the end. Um, so oil by rail traffic is at record levels, both in Canada and the, and the United States, after a, a, a drop. You can see the comparison. And the Alberta government, uh, for a whole variety of reasons, uh, uh, has actually made a commitment to, to buy oil trains, uh, 7,000 cars, 80,000 locomotives, to increase uh, the volume by an additional 125,000 barrels per day, and most most of that oil that's produced in in Canada goes goes south. 80% is exported, 99.9% uh, to the U.S. And at the same time, there's been an increase in in train runaways since Lac Megantic, uh, and so major spills are happening. And I mentioned Moser, I mentioned Iowa in in May, and have the lessons uh, been learned? Um, and basically, they haven't, and I point out uh, uh, why they haven't, and and why um, you know the government, the prime minister is arguing for pipeline expansion uh, in Canada because they're safer than dangerous rail. I mean, what a disingenuous statement from someone who's responsible for ensuring it's uh, as it it it's as safe and not doing all that's necessary. So, in a word. They have not, and the window is still open. Uh, and I do talk about the cascading tragedies in the town. I can talk about that. That's a picture of before and after. Uh, a year before, you can see the church there. Uh, that's four years after. It's still just an open desert. There's been some reconstruction, but the actual town center is that open desert, and that is another tragedy. Uh, and the and the people, the the coalition, the activists are are demanding a judicial inquiry, and they've got a, a parliamentary petition going. And if anybody wants to pick up that link and and uh, and sign that petition, uh, I urge you to. Uh, and so I just end with just based on the lessons I learned about what they what those activists in Lac Megantic. Uh, are doing. Uh, I just kind of prepared for the people uh, in the communities that I went to in northern New Brunswick, and I'm sure there, 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 there are lessons and suggestions that you are well aware of, and that you are um, are uh, are involved uh, uh, and as part of uh, your ac your actions and your activism. Uh, so that's these are my parting words. And they're from a, a book that was very inspirational. I've come to know the author. She lost her brother in the o Ocean Ranger. It was an oil rig that sank off the coast of Newfoundland in, in the early 80s. And, sh and she wrote this, and I'll read it. Time and time again, publics trust governments to ensure that companies operate prudently. Time and time again, we are shocked by a new disaster caused by corporate negligence. We say we will never forget, then we forget, and then it happens again. So let's not forget Lac Megantic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Really appreciate you coming. Let's hear it for Bruce. So, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, ten minutes to buy a book. So, if folks want to um, get a book. Twenty minutes to buy a book. Twenty minutes to buy a book. But know that if you don't get a book, uh, yeah. So, if you need to do that, no, I won't be offended. You feel free to go and take care of business. That's fine. Everybody, my name is Bill Moyer, and uh, thank you so much to UW Bookstore and to. Uh, uh, my friend Fitz, Fritz Edler for, uh, for the, teaching me so much about the re realities of rail all along this journey and for bringing Bruce Campbell here and especially Mary Patterson for uh, your organizing. Thank you. All right. So, uh, yeah, I saw another quote about how the thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Okay. Uh, this is not funny. Uh, really, you know, uh, this is the hundred year old tunnel underneath Seattle, you know, uh, but 
you know, as much as we're opposed to this, uh, I think that one of the lessons from Backbone Campaign over the years has been that our no is only as powerful as our yes is compelling. So some years ago, we were challenging some railroad labor folks about our coal trains and oil trains, you know, the best thing we can do with this incredible infrastructure. And there's like, well, uh, we were involved in a, in a uh, 2008 report around the Northern Transcon. Why don't you see if your people can green it? That was the end of like a six month conversation. So we're trying to be fast here. Uh, um, so I built a team of great folks. Solutionary Rail, a people powered campaign to electrify America's railroads and open corridors to a clean energy future. Our vision is to electrify major rail corridors for faster, cleaner trains that provide a more reliable service for people and goods. We want to draw high-value cargo off of roads and back onto the tracks for highly efficient transportation and near-zero carbon emissions. And we envision opening rail corridors for the transmission of renewable energy, unlocking stranded wind and solar assets, which will not only power the trains, but also the communities they travel to. The United States has the largest economy in the world, yet its transportation infrastructure is overloaded, underfunded, and crumbling. Meanwhile, we are failing to provide solutions for the most pressing environmental and economic needs of the 21st century. The taxpayer-subsidized highway system built in the 1950s triggered an exodus of freight and passengers off of the trains and onto cars and trucks, accelerating the decline of U.S. railroads. Rail transport was forced to become increasingly dependent on moving cheap, heavy, and often dangerous payloads with longer, slower-moving trains making fewer stops and abandoning regular service to the communities that they served. Now, ever smaller crews are forced to work without schedules, on call 24-7, which results in chronic fatigue that endangers workers and trackside communities. Meanwhile, semi-trucks clog ports, towns, and freeways, causing disproportionate wear and tear on our roads, killing thousands each year on freeways, and polluting the air with diesel exhaust. The rest of the world is overcoming these problems by electrifying their railroads. Many countries in Europe and Asia have made massive investments in publicly owned railroads that rapidly transport goods and people. Unlike national railroads of other countries, U.S. freight railroads are almost entirely owned and operated by private companies, maintaining their own tracks, unable and unwilling to make the large long-time investments for electrification and track modification. Solutionary Rail addresses these challenges through a tax-exempt, not-for-profit steel interstate development authority, creating a public-private partnership with railroads and other stakeholders to finance, build, and operate the electrification and transmission infrastructure. Our vision champions the needs of numerous stakeholders for rail workers, minimum crew sizes, set schedules, and improved working conditions for passengers, decreased travel times through higher speed rail networks. For farmers, increased capacity for bulk commodities and faster, more reliable service for moving perishable crops to market. For tribes, right-of-way justice, energy sovereignty, and export opportunities. For trackside communities, reduced air pollution from diesel exhaust. For green energy developers and rural electric co-ops, new transmission opportunities and access to distant customers. For the railroad industry, increased market share of high-value freight and long-term vitality. And for rural communities, an opportunity for access, economic renewal, and cultural vibrance. Solutionary Rail is a people-powered campaign for sustainable transportation and a clean energy future. And now we need you to help move this people-powered campaign forward. Join the team. Learn more at SolutionaryRail.org. So that's just a really efficient way of trying to give you an introduction to Solutionary Rail, which is actually quite complex. And I'll tell you, when we started this project, I knew nothing about rail. When the guy told me, when Mike Elliott said, well, the, talked about the paper about the Northern Transcon, I didn't even know what the Northern Transcon was. So my learning curve has been huge and it's been really fascinating. But I'm a student of grand strategy and the, the power of building alliances and what has kept me continually engaged in, in the learning curve that, it, that is this project has been 
the, the number of sectors in our society that, whose interests are connected by the railroads. So I'm going to do my best to just speed through some slides here and um, so that we can get to the discussion since we've got this wonderful guest in town, guests in town. Uh, advantage of trains, trains are far more efficient than, than wheels on trucks, right? So the, uh, one of the basic fundamental problems we're trying to solve with solutionary rail is how do we shift the business model of rail away from long trains, fewer, on, not on a schedule, uh, with smaller crew sizes, that skip all those communities that they used to serve along the route and redirect to a business model for rail that serves those communities, spreads out the impacts of, of intermodal freight, and, and, and helps us decarbonize our transportation infrastructure. So it's not just about trains. It's not about de just about decarbonizing trains. Uh, electrifying trains, if that's all we did and we kept the current business model, that's really not going to be enough. The, 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 the reason why it's so important that we shift the business model so that the service is, uh, is spread out across those communities is, is so that we can decarbonize trucking. And that means we have to have trucks that go a couple hundred miles a day, not a thousand miles a day, if we're going to do this kind of work that we need to be, be done at the speed that needs to be done. So there's lots of ways that electric, elect, trains are more efficient and electricity is more efficient than diesel fuel. Like we've said in the video, it is happening around the world. In Switzerland, they actually have the trucks drive on to the train. Why not in the US? Well, that's a long history that I've been having to you know, get educated on and people like Fritz Edler back there has been a key part of that education. Uh, but one aspect of it is that our, pri our infrastructure is privately owned. Um, it's, it's, in, it's competing with a publicly subsidized uh, re uh, freeway infrastructure. The capitalization costs of the kinds of improvements we'd need to make in terms of grade separation and electrification are something that is a, it's a daunting proposal for a private industry that's worried about quarterly profits. Uh, and it, the, the actual price of electrification is not really that much. When you compare some of the early numbers of that, uh, the ultra high speed rail, what I call a boondoggle, that's so fashionable right now with the governor and, um, and Bill Gates, is that uh, they're talking about 125 million to a billion dollars per mile, new right of way, and it's not gonna carry freight. So we're talking about a two million to two and a half million dollars per mile for double track. Um, and another impediment that's are the economists that worked on this. And again, this is a big team of people who worked on solutionary rail. I hired uh, Patrick Mazza to help us put together a lot of the pieces into this book in a readable way. So, um, you know, but one of the, uh, the, the economists, Bruce uh, McFarlane, He's identified that um, one of the impediments is if the private railroad companies do the infrastructure improvement along their right of way, their property taxes, just like when you build a house on land, the, the, the property taxes for those improvements are one of the impediments. And then uh, the need to electrify across large uh, cor across corridors. So the uh, one, this guy Bruce, uh, the economist, one of his big ideas and uh, some of the others we've been influenced by is the idea of creating a public belt. Having the, new, the infrastructure improvements actually owned by some tax exempt entity. So the federal government, the states could be in that role or what I think would be a poetic, historically poetic uh, situation would be if the tribes, for instance, owned that infrastructural improvement. So that's what we're calling the Steel Interstate Development Authority. And it would uh, issue tax exempt bonds, uh, it would uh, access federal TIFIA funding, et cetera, to finance and operate that electrified corridor. 
that corridor that we, of course, were dealing with because we were in the process of fighting oil trains and coal trains and we wanted to come up with a better vision for the future, is the northern transcon. This is it. There's a southern and a, and a northern route. The, uh, the current Empire Builder train goes along the northern part, missing the population center of Montana, sadly. So uh, that's about uh, 4,400 miles worth of track. Now, if you'll see on this map, this is the, the lines are weighted by volume. So the real corridor that's, uh, that's got the most volume out here is the Southern Transcon. The route from LA Long Beach through Kansas City to Chicago. It's very possible that the folks in California who are already leading the way on decarbonizing transportation may beat us to the punch on this. And that's, it's a competitiveness, you know, for some people that's a great argument, right? That we don't want California to get, be able to get freight to, um, to Chicago faster than uh, our Northern Transcon. But what's also true there is that there's lots of uh, solar rich territory in there, just like there is in, um, wind rich on, along the north. So this is not an unprecedented idea. Other countries came to us to learn about electrification. This is, I believe, in 1909, the uh, tunnel, Cascade Tunnel. Um, and in Washington State in 1928, we had three times more uh, tracks, 10 times more rail jobs. Nearly every community, Vash, except for Vashon, was served. Uh, uh, Fifteen percent of all of our electric, uh, of all of our rail in Washington State was electrified, and we've been using regenerative braking since 1915. This is not something new that Toyota came up with. Okay, so there's a chart, hard to read, of course, but what we get to in the end is that down in the bottom right, I think 759 miles of electrified rail in Washington State in 1928. So we're not talking about. Uh, a, a Tesla, uh, you know, or a, um, what's his face? Who's Tesla? Tesla? Elon, Elon Musk. Musk. Like, I, I, what's that tube thing he wants to do? That Hyperloop. That, Hyperloop. No, it's not that. It's not that stu something we haven't ever done before. This is totally doable. Um, here's where we get to, uh, to take a little peek at the business model, what we're talking about. So railroads will say, oh, yeah, we, um, uh, we move, you know, a large amount of the uh, the ton miles of freight in the U.S., but what they but they move r very little of the actual value of freight in the U.S. Only 3.5 percent of the value of freight at the time of the writing of this book. 75, 70 percent of the value of freight moves on trucks and some on planes. So, our objective is to find a way to get those trucks, that valuable freight off of the trucks and onto the tracks and figure out how can we move it with the kind of regularity, the speed, and uh, in order to be competitive with trucks. So this is on-dock uh, electrification because down in Tacoma they actually have uh, the capacity for on-dock rail or have on-dock rail. Some of the reasons we need to do this, obviously highway damage, the uh, takes thousands of cars to equal the same kind of damage that a, that a semi-truck does on our roads. We can harness stranded renewable uh, energy. This is a uh, rendering that is trying to communicate that we have the transmission elect electrification, uh, transmission lines above the electrification infrastructure, moving that high, uh, the, uh, the wind of the Midwest out to population centers, accessing the um, sun-rich regions of the Southwest, and allowing, this is an interesting thing I learned in the process, was that 75% of our uh, land mass is served by rural electrical cooperatives. Now they've actually been resisting uh, a distributed renewable energy, which is sort of, it was originally sort of surprising to me. I think they'd be encouraging their farmers to put up windmills and, and such. But because they're paying off the debt of the, uh, of the fossil fuel generation, they don't want cheap energy to come online that goes for, gets for, is sold prior to their, uh, their dirty energy. So, so I think they're turning around on that, but if you think about providing them a way to transmit all of that energy, then you can imagine them maybe shifting their, uh, their, their vision. 
This is a map of, done by some folks from the a NOAA, NOAA scientists who are modeling how do we get to 80% renewable energy by 2030. And the important part is not all the little dots of how we generate the energy. The really important part in this is, are those lines. That is a grid of high voltage DC efficient transmission so that we start balancing the variability of renewable energy so that when the wind's not blowing here, it's definitely blowing someplace and vice versa. Now that grid and this grid, so this is a rail passengers a map of the, the uh, yellow lines are existing uh, passenger rail. Um, but that, the density of those lines and, and the grid that was suggested in the other map, um, to me, they kind of match. And it's to me that says, well, why not use those corridors rather than having to cut additional corridor? Did I just skip something? I, that, yeah, this is just an argument that this is a great alliance building opportunity with passenger, those interested in passenger rail. Um, labor has been a partner with us since the very first challenge of greenness. Uh, report or with Railroad Workers United. Uh, now, over the last number of years, I've been backbone campaign and solutionary rail project has been involved with the Moving Forward Network, uh, addressing the impact of diesel on communities and how the warehousing of our current system and the way it concentrates impacts because of long haul trucking. Um, there are thousands and thousands of trucks going through these communities and poisoning the air and killing people. But this is transpartisan. This is not just a progressive issue. These are the communities that have been left along the wayside, passed by for many decades now. We can renew their economic vitality and cultural access, um, provide a quicker uh, uh, opportunity for crops uh, to get to market, and, um, and we can also solve problems for the, around uh, historical problems around uh, right-of-way justice for tribes. Right-of-way justice and export of, of, of renewable energy for tribes is a, a major aspect of this and another reason why tribes could play a really important leadership role. You can see all the number of tribes along the routes north and south. So I was just down at the uh, affiliated tribes, uh, affiliated ATNI, affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians uh, conference on Monday. And I'll tell you, um, Tribes have been asking for renewable energy opportunities. This is Standing Rock. There's a BNSF line through there. Standing Rock, that, that dark yellow, that's a very high wind intensity. These are places that have been asking for this. We've got lots, so Backbone Campaign and Solutionary Rail Project has been doing uh, interviews of stakeholders over the last two years, uh, trying to build this grassroots uh, coalition. Uh, this is just another example of another port that could use uh, out in Grays Harbor that might be uh, an interesting example of a, trying to uh, electrify a corridor and use it for transmission to get wind energy from the coast uh, to the I-5 corridor. And then now uh, Tom White, a great uh, rail engineer who's been involved for 30 years in Washington State DOT rail planning, um, he came up, has come up with a proposal for an inland port um, in Moses Lake and doing a, a new line that would start in Auburn and help bring container traffic to Moses Lake and other places. So right now we're working like tomorrow we're going to be at the legislature um, is doing a presentation in the Senate building trying to tell folks that, hey, we need an interdisciplinary study of the feasibility of the, feasibility study of the ideas presented in the Solutionary Rail book. And we need that from the Transportation Department, but we need the whole uh, legislature to get behind this, whether they're energy, environment, or transportation. The problem is this is a very interdisciplinary problem. And the issue silos of the agencies and the academia is a stumbling block for us uh, actually being able to uh, get the funding that's necessary to prove the point so we can move forward. So what we ask for you to do is to share this, uh, the video that you saw earlier, solutionaryrail.org forward slash SR video. Uh, pass a resolution in your local group and join lots of other organizations around the state who've done so. And help us make this a priority. Jake Fye, the other day when I was, uh, you know, how you deal with legislators, you have to just kind of get in the way. Um, I, he said, you know, people need to be asking me about this. I need to feel, he'd be hearing from this, about this from other people than you, basically is what he said. So help us out with that. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I look forward to the discussion.
Hey, thank you. I, uh, I know you all didn't specifically come to hear this, uh, and I'm hopefully you'll have questions and want to engage in the conversations about our other presenters, but I just want to bring things, make things very, very concrete for folks. Uh, in the last uh, year, in 2018, 22 railroad workers died in North America, eight of them in Canada in that time. Each year, the number of runaways, Bruce mentioned this, number of runaway trains has increased. And that alone should be enough to tell you that there's something very, very wrong here than the narrative, the story you're being told by the government and by the railroad companies, because you have this tragedy that incinerates families and kills all these people in the small town of Lac Megantic. And you would expect, and they tell you, that they've learned those lessons and they've incorporated them and they've fixed the, the problems and what, and yet the next year, a larger number, the year after that, a larger number, the year after that, it continues. The trains today in North America are unprecedentedly long, up to 250 cars and seven and eight locomotives. Uh, they are longer, they're heavier, and some of the you know, products that Bruce has been talking about in particular, the, the crude, the volatile crude, is an unprecedentedly dangerous product, a product that, I mean, people hear crude oil, and I actually have, I, you know, try to get activists to make sure they're clear about this. When they hear crude oil, they just think like the oil that we had 50 years ago and 100 years ago that hadn't been refined yet. This is a whole new ball game, this volatile oil that we're talking about today. Uh, and the, it is so incredibly lucrative when they transport it the way that they have in mind transporting it that it will uh, that it means that they rush forward to do whatever they have to do uh, without having necessarily done all the other things. But the point I'm trying to make to you is that the situation that existed in 2013 is a lot worse today, and it's not just worse because of oil. It's also worse because of speed up. It's worse because they take less time to train people. It's worse because they continuously try to reduce the number of railroad workers, skilled, experienced people capable of using judgment on the trains. Uh, they're exhausted, they're threatened with discipline when they uh, try to get more rest. And these are all essentially unprecedented things. And in the industry, it's a chaotic thing. Many, many people have lost their jobs in the last uh, year because of the precision railroading thing that Bruce was talking about, especially in the east on the CSX and railroads like that. The CSX railroad is a, has effectively become a hedge fund. And uh, so the, everything that decisions they make, policies they make are all about the next quarter not about five years from now, not about 10 years from now, and not even about railroad transportation because their quarterly numbers are really all about money and it might you might get the money by selling off the important things or so getting with, rid of the safety With Lock Megantique, you were the trial support for Tom Harding and Richard Labrie, at least um, mm -hmm. helping with America and um, you know find out and telling that story and to get some support for that just tying back to Bruce's mm -hmm. book and to getting on track of the uh, what that was like. Yeah. Um, Bruce didn't really get to tell much about kind of what it, what happened as, as the railroaders being scapegoats and I mean this luckily you'll read the book and you'll get to hear the larger mm -hmm. story but maybe some of the stuff that's left out of that and kind of the background information that's not told in the book of what you experienced at in Lock Maganti. Uh, you actually pretty much gave it in a nutshell. This is a situation where what we know, what Bruce is able to document is really, ironically, it's really only something that we know about because there was a criminal trial. They shouldn't have put these people under those criminal charges, but the fact that they did opened up a huge amount of stuff that is otherwise keeping, kept hidden by the government and the railroads. and. Uh, just a little more than a year ago, in the first week of January last year, the trial, which went on for months, uh, culminated in, in all of these guys being acquitted of the charges that 
would have put them in prison for the rest of their life. It hasn't stopped the regulators and the railroads from trying to essentially say that they were the guilty parties and that uh, uh, that everything is good and everybody should just move on. But anyway, that the, and the support of everybody uh, who was involved in this part of the world and that was a key thing to what we were able to do. But working together uh, with the uh, heroic actions of the people in the community of Lac Megantic, along with others all around, allies all around the world, uh, we did have success with that, and, and I thought that was a real valuable thing. Could you just quickly introduce yourself? Sorry? Could you just quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Fritz Edler. I'm a special representative for Railroad Workers United. I headed up the Harding and Labrie Defense Committee uh, internationally up, you know, through the whole time of the trial. I'm a 40-year railroad worker. I ended up running high-speed trains for Amtrak in the Northeast uh, uh, before I took on this work. And um, uh, so what uh, we in the industry have a big fight before ourselves to be safe and to uh, make sure that we have a industry that continues not only to serve the communities that it goes through in the country and the economy, but to keep all of us alive and uh, and have it with sustainable work. And there is, you know, controversy within our own ranks, but Railroad Workers United in particular has decided that this is a story that we really have to fight for. So, yeah. so um, one of the things we can celebrate is that King County Council, as many of you know, have um, has a... Uh, uh, moratorium on but it was an ordinance for a moratorium on no new fossil fuel infrastructure so it feels like a time when we start not saying no anymore but moving towards the yes so for this question i'd like that um somebody and many people i've noticed want to know about solutionary rail how do we pay for it how is that what does that vision look like in a nutshell in a nutshell uh, in a nutshell, solutionary rail, the railroad infrastructure uh, would likely be paid for by private activity bonds, f access to federal private activity bonds, and the um, TIFIA loans, and the, then user fees that would be charged by the entity that does the developing uh, to the, the railroad uh, companies who are moving freight. Here's a question. In Western Washington, communities have delayed or stopped terminal construction for fossil fuel transport by water. What is the nature of the St. John's terminus? Does anyone, does the questioner want to? I, I was just curious about what kind of fossil fuels were transporting in St. John's. Was it both oil and coal? Or? I'm not sure. Who you're addressing? That, yeah. Yeah. For whom that's? I can't speak to that directly, but I can say that there is, there has been a move across the country, in different port areas to try and find ways around the, uh, the, uh, uh, to find ways to be able to locally uh, limit the expansion of these oil terminals and. Uh, and so there have been some successes. For example, I was able to work successfully with a lot of people in Baltimore, and we were able to do that in Baltimore. Uh, so I don't know specifically the answer about the ports that you're speaking of, but this is, I can tell you this, there are people working here today on that. Um, so um, we have multiple questions for Bruce about um, the people of Lac Migantic and their PTSD or their, how they're doing mentally, um, and also the public health um, sure. Questions. Um, you know, as I, I I went over that, really, I skipped over that. So uh, let me just expand on that a little bit. Um, so it's a deeply wounded community, um, but but there are also you know wonderful stories of courage and prevailing and 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 not being crushed beneath the wheel. Uh, but the level of PTSD is is still going on six years now affecting a majority of the population there's still you know there are people people leaving the community is not growing and the economy is very fragile um, and there's been division in in the community I'll talk a little bit about that but uh, you know young people um, you know thoughts of suicide it's it's double what it is in the rest of the province so you know these these are 
are, you can imagine, a community uh, that has, you know, trying to recover from a, a tragedy like that. And there, you know, I, I mentioned cascading tragedies. And one of the tragedies is that um, the, um, the victims' families were exploited by um, ambulance chasers or case runners, whatever you want to call them. There's this guy came up from El Paso, a guy who, you know, really um, kind of monitors disasters worldwide, and he's there. He's there right when it happens. He's a very clever guy. He stays out of the camera, uh, but he's kind of connecting with, uh, with, with lawyers in Quebec so to figure out how it works in, in Quebec. And so, you know, within, within days, basically, after it happened, he had convened a meeting of all of the victims' families uh, at this hotel, and he basically sold them uh, the storyline that if they signed up with him, that they could get justice from him because uh, because you could get you know uh, but the U the U.S. was a, um, you know you could get justice uh, uh, f f you know more effectively and and uh, I mean he he had a law firm but he wasn't a lawyer and he just signed up uh, uh, those people and then handed them off to wrongful death lawyers so eventually in the civil suit. Uh, you know, part of the civil suit went for the wrongful death, uh, to, uh, and and forty percent of that went to to the lawyers, and that's just there was also a and I won't go into it. Uh, I could, but um, uh, kind of if anybody has read Naomi Klein's book, The Shock Doctrine, well, there was a shock doctrine element to this as well, where there was money for reconstruction, and uh, kind of disaster capital has kind of swooped down and convinced people municipally in power that they needed to wipe the slate clean like that big desert that you saw and and you know a majority of people a big majority of people didn't want all those buildings that they tore down after the fire they didn't have to but it was kind of you know let's wipe this creative destruction is what it was and it's very divisive and so those are just kind of a sense of some of the things that are that are going on but i you know a lot of those people who you know, people, both Fritz and I have met and worked with, uh, they're real heroes in this story. Uh, another question for Fritz. Um, what are the safety concerns? What are the greatest safety concerns in U.S. railroading today? How can low-cost fin financing be secured for implementing electrified rail for you, Bill? Um, would stakeholder control versus purely stake shareholder control help uh, improve rail operations? If you can semi-repeat the question so it's in the mic of what you're going to answer, that would be helpful. Uh, the U.S. railroading, the greatest? Yeah, the, uh, I, the greatest threat facing the railroad today, it's a little hard to sift it out because there's a number of them, is, is basically the inappropriate use of technology. Probably all of you here, because this is a community that has suffered themselves with the, with the wreck of the Amtrak Train 91 about a year ago, have heard about uh, three initials, PTC, stands for Positive Train Control. And in the media, all the reports of the incident stuff will say that the answer to that wreck and to the 188 wreck outside Philadelphia and a bunch of others is PTC. This is because the positive regulators, train. positive train control, the regulators, the government people have no <coughs> political will and, and no uh, courage to take on the, the obvious questions that have always been posed in these things, which is when reckless decisions get made about crews or about the right of way or about the training or about other kinds of things like that. Those are considered to be the decisions of private businesses that aren't supposed to be interfered with. PTC is a valuable tool. I'm going to try to wrap this up. Let me just say this. The goal of every North American railroad today is not single person crew, it's zero person crew. The industry associations make this clear. They're in, they, they tell you, in so many words in all the reports, that the problem is human beings. These human beings, they screw up, they may not only make mistakes, but sometimes like this Tom Harding guy and others, they, uh, they do bad things. And that if we could just replace 
all of those people with uh, shiny technology, then, then you will be safe. So that's the central problem, is the inappropriate use of technology. Technology, I mean, I can speak, because I've, I've run these trains for decades myself. We want all the tools we can get. Give us tools. But don't try to pretend that those tools are something other than that. Don't try to pretend like they are substitutes for experienced, trained, judgment-capable human beings. Enough of them with enough rest to be able to do what needs to be done, not only to prevent wrecks, but also to be there to protect people in the aftermath of bad things. Um, okay. uh, one of the things that I wanted to clarify is that with solutionary rail, uh, we can't say no oil on the tracks. The, but the trains are a common carrier. They're a regulated monopoly. Uh, they have been deregulated to the point that they're no longer necessarily serving a public interest. And I think one of the biggest things we've got to do is we've got to update what does it mean to, to be a regulated monopoly, a common carrier? What is the public goods that that uh, entities, corporate entities that it get to be privileged enough to exist in that very important and uh, that space, what, is, what are their obligations? So our, the idea that we are shifting, it's, the idea of common carrier is both the sense of what is our basic agreement with the corporations, also we can't tell them what not to carry, we just want to slow down the bad, make it more expensive, and speed up the good. And, and figure out a way to do that. And so that the economy of rail shifts so that we're paying for stuff that's being shipped on trucks. Why not have that be shipped on trains? Now, part of that might be the financing would be a gas tax or tr on trucks, et cetera. But mostly I think what we're talking about is some kind of infrastructural long time, a long-term amortized investment in infrastructure that is publicly owned and not just a bailout to the railroad companies. That's the other danger is that the, like we did in 1970 when we created Amtrak, that wasn't a takeover, that was a bailout. Because they were no longer able, the railroad companies were no longer able to profitably provide the, their, their, regular, their um, required service and, and they wanted to cut lines and the only way they could do that is if they were forgiven of that obligation and then that's when we created Amtrak to help them out. So all three of you have been on the road sending your message to as many people as possible. So I'm wondering, can you summarize what it is that you want us to know, what you want us to hear, what you want us to tell other people, what you want us to do? If, if, you, had, if you had the chance to just program us, what is it that we could do, say, or be? And what, what is your core message and what is the reason you're getting up every day and, and saying this message to, to people? every day. Anyone can start that has an idea. Okay. Go ahead. We'll say best for last. Um, so uh, I would say that people are talking about a Green New Deal. This is a perfect opportunity for a Green New Deal. People are talking about just transition. Well, it's not just transition. Is It's not enough to just talk about solar panels on roof in neighborhoods. We've got to have an infrastructure that's supporting the localization of economies that stops poisoning people. We need to think bigger. We have to have a bigger vision. And, it's, and we, the, our representatives, our legislators, they don't have an imagination. They follow us. Do not mistake elected uh, politicians for leaders. We are the leaders. We need to bring our collective imagination to solving the problems because we don't have very much time and they need to be connecting the dots, and we've done our best with Solutionary Rail to help them do that. You know, I'm, I'm, I think I said at the outset that I'm, I'm, I'm doing this with, with the support and trust of the people that I've come to know and admire in Lac Megantic, and so they want me to tell their story um, with a view uh, to inform others of what can happen uh, with corporate negligence and regulatory failure and and uh, and to um, and, and and so the the understanding and knowledge of it will act as a kind of a means to take action to prevent 
another Lac-Megantic from happening. And you know, when the, when, the, when the cameras went away and memories fade and the railways say, you know, they've learned their lessons and the regulars said, we put all these measures in place. Uh, and then, so, it, you know, kind of, yeah, mem memories fade. People think, uh, you know, it's a, it, everything's been done. And in fact, everything hasn't been done. And as Fritz, Fritz said, in many ways, it's, it's worse than it was, and the volumes are at, at record levels. So it's just, you know, a cautionary tale. Uh, it's, a, it's a warning. It's a warning. It's for citizens to become engaged. It's for, uh, for legislators to become engaged and to become aware. And it's for, uh, you know, the people in northern BC have been working closely with First Nations group who have, tend to have legal standing and can engage in ways that just, you know, a small citizens group can't. Uh, but there are things that can be done. There are actions that can be taken and they can be and they can make a difference. I mean, we're, these are powerful forces that we're working against. Uh, but that's, you know, that's not to say that, you know, that, that real change can happen by citizens uh, who are determined for that to occur. So I guess that's the message, uh, or it's one, one of the messages anyway. Yeah. Well, like Bruce, I was terribly, powerfully affected by the reality of going to Lac Megantic again and again and meeting the people there. I would have said before that experience that the important thing I would have said that most you need to know is what I said before is that left to their own devices, they will replace all the human beings. But between now and then, there will be a whole bunch of dangerous, crazy stuff that that will result in a percentage of disasters. The question of when and where and what community, and you saw how far that train that destroyed the town of Lac Megantic traveled. It traveled through Canadian cities, it traveled through U.S. cities. It could have happened in any of those places and those forces were in place. Uh, it is a life or death matter on a certain level. As a railroader, I believe in the possibilities of rail. That's why I'm so excited about the visionary and yet practical vision that's put forward by the Solutionary Rail Project. If there's something that I want you to go away from this is that right now in the public sphere, there's only one story in the public sphere, and that is nothing to see here, folks. Move on. Nothing to see, you know, we've fixed everything, just like Bruce said, it's all fixed, the guilty have been held responsible. Ed Burkhart, the man you saw the picture of, is still on the board of directors of the biggest fracking railroad in the United States. It's the Wheeling and Lake Erie. It is the biggest offender on pushing on the questions of single person crew. It is the biggest offender on the risky behaviors in the United States. So this is not so, and, and he had no consequences, no meaningful consequences from having destroyed two towns, not just Lac Megantic, but also a previous situation where a town burned for a week because of the way that they organized their policies. We need protection for our communities and our workers today. We need protection for the environment. And we can make the railroads of this country the green transportation future. But it's also possible we can lose that. And we will lose it if we don't contest that in the public space. That's one of the reasons why we want you to hear this message, read these books, talk to your friends about it. And that's it. I just want to, just to add a little footnote, which is that, uh, you know, the example, the, the, the inspiring example of solutionary rail, I think is, you know, for me, um, you know, I. It, you know, going forward, uh, you know, when people, you know, they were asking you years ago, what about yes to, you know, what, what are you doing? You're criticizing, but you're not providing solutions. And I think these are really, really inspiring and a lesson for me going forward as I continue this debate and engagement with the powers that be. There's just one to last that. question about a link for a petition of the judicial review. Is it's in the book you said, or no? It's uh, it was. Uh, I, I
I don't know how to make it okay. uh, available. No, because this just this is very recent. Okay. Uh, it's a it's a, a parliamentary petition, and that's the link to the the Parliament of Canada website. Okay. And if you go to that link, then you can sign the petition. And you know, probably technically. Uh, you're not allowed. To, I mean, it doesn't have doesn't have force because you're U.S. citizens. But just just so knowing yeah. that the support uh, is coming f from here to the people of Lac Megantic who are behind uh, behind this petition. So that's I don't know how you can through your website or yeah we could do it. Uh, yeah. There's an event page on Facebook would be one way. If you go to uh, uh, the Solution Area Facebook page, we can put we can add that uh, to the event page for tonight's event. So what you just have to understand about that is that there has never, ever been a real public judicial inquiry into the lack megantic wreck. That's some, that's what this petition is about, and that's what they need. And let me just say this: uh, you should follow that link, whatever like that. But would there is there any objection here tonight? to Bruce being able to go back to Canada and say that the assembled people in this forum tonight supported that effort and call, you know, call upon the Canadian government to uh, do that, that inquiry. All right. Sure, sure. Bill, Bruce, Fritz, thank Thanks. you so much. I will bring that up. Thank you minutes to talk with them and um, get a book signed or ask any last minute questions.